everyone. It's Stephanie with The Patient Story. I'm so thrilled to introduce our next conversation that we're publishing. It's with Barbara R., who talks about her experience with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, a subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And she was diagnosed just a couple of years ago at 70 years old. Barbara talks about everything. She truly shares openly talking about everything from her treatment, which included chemo, CAR T cell therapy, and a clinical trial, but also talks about very important uh, aspects of how it impacted her life um, all the way to now uh, dealing with survivorship. But first, let's learn more about who Barbara is outside of the cancer context, because as we know, we are so much more than our diagnosis. Well, I'm 72 years old. I've had cancer before. I had breast cancer 20 years ago. Um, I'm a real active person and uh, avid gardener. And I sailed for 42 years. I have two little granddaughters that I am involved in their life and lots of friends and family. So Surrounded by love, right? Yes, and, and I have a wonderful husband. Wonderful. And I know that um, our caregivers are such an important part of this entire experience. Um, but, but Barbara, let's rewind back to 2020 um, before COVID hit. Right. Um, <laughs> about January, February, you said you started to feel some first symptoms. What were those? They were like epigastric pain, like stomach pain, abdomen pain. Um, I kind of brushed it off. I thought, you know, it's just uh, acid stomach. Uh, whatever I ate isn't agreeing with me. Um, and I had some other health issues going on at the same time. So it just got set on the back burner for probably too long. But finally, I went to gastroenterology. Well, I went to my PCP doctor who referred me to a gastroenterologist uh, to get to the bottom of it because it was really increasing. When you say increasing, you mean that pain that you were dealing with in the abdomen stomach area was just getting worse and worse? Worse and worse to the point where I couldn't get in a comfortable position. It, it just kind of went beyond a, a stomach ache. So I, I knew something was wrong. Right. Were there also other issues like, you know, bowel movements were impacted? Um, not that I can remember. Then ordered an endoscopy for you, uh, March 12th, uh, you know, then also took biopsies uh, during the procedure of unusual polyps. So how did he or she communicate to you what they had seen? Yeah, I think it was right after the endoscopy, you know, everything went fine. I, I just did see a polyp that, that I biopsied. So um, it'll take a few days, you know, and I'll get back to you. So um, uh, apparently, you know, it took more than a few days. So, but he was concerned because he ordered a CT scan after that. And there was looked like a mass on the head of my pancreas. So that was alarming enough to call me and say he suspected pancreatic cancer, which was, you know, alarmed me and my family. And I decided, you know, I need to go to a good cancer um, center. So I called Cancer Care Alliance in Seattle and I set up an appointment and a team for the pancreatic cancer. And then just a few days before my appointment, that gastroenterologist called and says, we have the biopsy report. It's not pancreatic cancer. You have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Talk about so many hits. The first time I want to rewind back to when, you know, he called you and said, I see this mass, it's concerning. I'm afraid you may have pancreatic cancer. Right. What was, I mean, was this the first time cancer had been brought up and what was, how did you process that in that moment? What were you feeling? What were you thinking? I was like alarmed. Like, I, I mean, I knew the uh, severity of pancreatic cancer and 
I just wanted to get into treatment right away. I just like the next hour, <laughs> but, you know, the next day or how, and, and they, Cancer Care Alliance actually pushed me right into the system. So, um, and then as soon as they found out that it was a different diagnosis, they switched me um, to the hematology department. When all of a sudden the results show, oh, we're actually dealing with something completely different. This is non-Hodgkin lymphoma. What, what was your reaction then? And I wanna know also as an extra layer, as someone who'd already been through cancer, breast cancer. I was not totally unhinged. I mean, I thought, okay, I got through the other cancer. Um, I'll just get through this one. And, you know, was just sort of ready to take it on um, because that was a choice that seemed like the only choice I had. Right. It was, I have to do this. Now let's just figure out the best plan forward. Right. That I'm hearing. So, Barbara, did you at any point, well, they had said, here's this new diagnosis, you have non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but did you, when did you get the deeper, more detailed diagnosis of you have diffuse large B cell and stage? How did that happen? The oncologist that they set me up with at the cancer center ordered a PET scan before I even saw him. And then um, I think just a couple of days later, I had my appointment with him. He went over what the cancer was, that it was stage four, but that blood cancer is stage four, you could treat it, you know, and went over the R chop, and this is what we're gonna do first. And, you know, I just got it in my head that, okay, all right, we'll do this. And, even though you knew that stage four and blood cancer is different than in solid tumors, at any point, did you think I need a second opinion? Uh, what was it about the doctor you saw that made you feel, okay, this is the right path for me? For one thing, I knew that that was probably the, well, the best cancer center in the Seattle area. My daughter-in-law had worked with them for quite a few years in the hematology department. And she was confident. She says, this is the place you need to be. So I didn't really question it. Having that extra voice, someone who is close to you, who knows the system a little bit more too, that was enough to say, this is probably okay. Right, yes. And so um, in meeting the oncologist, what did uh, he or she say uh, in terms of treatment options, was more than one presented or was it RCHOP is the way to go? It was more or less RCHOP is the way to go. This is what we do. We start here. He, he didn't say that this was the only option. He just says, this is where we're going to start. It's good. It's good that you felt that confidence. And then Barbara, how did you break the news uh, to your fa you know, family and friends if you did um, about what you were going through? Um, my husband was with me for the appointment and I believe my daughter-in-law was, um, on speakerphone. She did that for my first appointment. And, um, I think I, I have a small family, just a son and his family and my, my husband. So the, the brothers, I have a brother and my husband has a brother. I think we waited for a while to discuss that with him until we knew more about what, what everything entailed. I didn't want to alarm everybody and my friends. I didn't go into that for a while. You waited to, to tell them yes. mostly yeah. because you wanted to get solid footing first, know what you're dealing right. with before, and you didn't want to cause anxiety for others. Right, right. right. Uh, how kind of you to be thinking of so many others in this moment. Um, so before the RCHOP, you did get a port placed. Um, yes. Was that fair for people who, you know, are about to get a port placed? Any, any sort of um, advice or comments? I think there's always fear about an invasive procedure. Um, I'd been through it before with my breast cancer. Um, 
I'm a really calm person and my advice is just to, you know, not be overly, I know it's hard, but try not to be overly anxious. And there's, you know, they uh, give you painkillers. It, it's really um, a fairly easy procedure. It's right under your skin and um, it doesn't take long. So um, I didn't have a problem with it. Good. I'm so glad. Um, yeah, I remember too being a little nervous and then it's, it's a pretty fast. Procedure. It is fast. Yes. Um, well, Barbara, I know from the dates you sent me that you got that full diagnosis on April 1st. And then five days later, you are there ready for your first uh, chemo infusion. So that wasn't very much time at all. And then I know for you, there was a, a little event essentially that that mass had caused elevated liver enzymes. And so you were jaundiced, you had to be hospitalized and do an alternate chemo because they said RCHOP was too dangerous. First, what was your reaction? You've already been diagnosed. You're ready to start treatment. Here's a setback. How did you, how did you observe that? That actually was scary to me because my husband had dropped me off. It was going to be a long day. We live about an hour away, so he was going to go home. So when they told me they had to hospitalize me, it was like um, almost a panic reaction, which I never do. But I had no car. I had no bag with any, you know, things I needed for the hospital. Um I wasn't prepared mentally for that at all. And COVID was really uh, strong then. Nobody wanted to be in the hospital. It was scary. It was, they assured me we have our own ward. Um, there'll be somebody right there to take you, which all was true. It, it was, uh, they arranged for me to have a ride, but there was just that moment of panic, like they're putting me in the hospital. I wasn't mentally prepared for that at all. I cannot imagine having to go through what you're going through, dealing with the setback and all with the backdrop of COVID at the height of the panic because right. we had no idea what we were dealing with um, in right. the world with this thing. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, since we're talking about it now with COVID, um, you know, really, I think it must have, just put this emphasis on isolation to an exponential degree. How did you get through those, the hardest times feeling so lo like uh, lonely and by yourself? Well, the hardest times were felt by everybody. So everybody was isolated in the beginning. And so I didn't feel like I was affected any more than anyone else. But as the months went by, especially when people got their COVID vaccines. And then I was told that, you know, my immune system might not react well to the vaccine. Then I started feeling more isolated. My husband did all the grocery shopping, did all the errands. I didn't like, and it, it actually, to some point, it's still that way. Um, but they have, I have got a second set of COVID vaccines and an Evoshield um, prophylactic shots, which makes me feel a lot better. But I did like um, see my immediate family. Um, my daughter-in-law was vaccinated right away and because she worked in healthcare. And I just, you know, had the few people after they got their vaccinations that I would see, but not in public places. Right, right. Have to be extremely cautious. So thank you for sharing that. Um, with the RCHOP, if you had to summarize, I know that first cycle was not. Um, do you remember what they had you do instead of RCHOP? I don't remember. It was an alternate. Um, it was alternate drugs that they had abandoned because our chop 
was uh, better. But since they couldn't do it, um, and the side effects, they had to watch more closely, and that's why they hospitalized me. I think I was there a week. Yeah, so you were there an entire week, and they finally released you. And the good news is the tumors had shrunk enough for you to be able to start on RCHOP the following cycle. Exactly, yes. And the pain had gone away. Oh, good, good. Yeah. So you started seeing relief pretty quickly in terms of the cancer. Really, really fast. Okay. Can you describe, um, so I know RCHOP, it's every three, it's a three-week cycle. You had six, but five, I guess, because the first one was an alternate. Right. Um, can you describe the side effects that you went through? And we'll talk about hair loss at the very end, but um, if you could laundry list. I, well, experienced the nausea. Once I got the nausea pills down so that I knew when to take them, it just takes experimenting. And I think it's different for everybody. So um, that took a while. I had some... Um, I remember getting dehydrated and having to go to the clinic for um, uh, fluids, IV. Um, so there was a kind of a rough spots with the nausea and vomiting. But then once that was under control, my appetite went down, but I did eat, you know. Um, and then I think as far as other side, I had a a side effect with um, skin flaking. I don't know if anybody else has had that, but it was just like extraordinary dry skin. I, it was, I'd never experienced anything like that. It, it just, so I was taking oil baths and, you know, and then it just went away and I'm sure that was a side effect too. So, okay. but other, other than the nausea, getting that under control, I think I, I did okay. Good, good. And did it get just cumulatively worse or better? It sounds like it got better after you got a handle on. I, um, yeah, it was just getting a handle on the anti-nausea medication. And for them to give it to me when I, you know, in the drip. And once everybody got what worked for me, then it, it was good. And we hear often from a lot of the people on the medical team, do you have to get out ahead of the nausea? You got to take the pills before right. you feel it because otherwise you're chasing. Right. And, and I made a mistake a couple of times with that, you know? So, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you got through, it was June, 2020. Um, throughout, you did get some platelet and blood transfusions, you said, which sometimes helps. Yes. I do right. want to talk to you about the hair loss because it's a big deal for a lot of people. I know, I don't know if you had lost your hair with your first cancer, breast cancer. Um, how, how was it this time around? You said you had your husband shave it, right? Yes, because it's just a nuisance. It, it starts looking dry and ugly. And then it's just hair is on, on your clothes on the couch. I mean, you know, I just says, okay, let's, let's just get rid of this. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, since I'd gone through it before, it wasn't so traumatic. Um, and it was sort of in the spring and summer, and I had a lot of really nice hats. Um, the one thing that bothered me more than the first time was my little granddaughters, because it's hard to hide you know, what is really going on with grandma. So at one point I was taking care of them and they had some little princess wigs and that. And I says, I'm going to try one of your wigs. And so I took my hat off and they hadn't seen me ball before. And the little one was a little alarmed. I says, look, I look pretty good in your wig, don't I? And then it, they started laughing and we had a good time. So that, you know, we got over that. But as far as my friends and my family, I, you know, it, it was, I wasn't embarrassed in front of them. And um, the thing about losing your hair that bothers me is it takes, seems like it takes so long to grow back, you know, and I kept, oh, I just wanted to, when I was like ready for it to grow back, I just wanted it to grow back. You know, but it, it's it's not overnight. It takes a while. 
I appreciate you bringing um, a couple of those points up. One, your latest point about how slowly it can grow back. Yes. To set expectations. I remember too, just like willing it past certain stages that felt yeah. awkward. And um, the other point about, you know, your, you know, the reaction from your young granddaughters. We've talked to other people too, about how do you deal with this whole notion of being sick with kids, especially younger kids? Is there anything else that you feel um, you've learned in communicating this that you think others might benefit from? Well, I think my daughter-in-law handled it best. I mean, I, you know, if they ask a question, we would answer, you know, but um, they would stay all night with us once in a while. And it was just kind of common. Well, grandma's got to lay down and, but, you know, kids are, they're not, fo they're focused on themselves, actually. <laughs> when they can go play outside, if the sun's out, you know, what's for dinner and can I have a treat? It, but so we didn't go into any details. They knew that their mother worked at a cancer center and that I was going to that same cancer center. And they were, oh, like four and six when um, I got sick. So they didn't ask a lot of questions and we didn't go into any details unless they did, so. So you were not hiding anything, but you wouldn't go into detail unless they prompted with a question or- working. Right. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch now. We're gonna move on to the second segment where we talk about that first relapse and um, the CAR T, which I think a lot of people will be very interested in. Right. So thank you, Barbara, and um, stick with us. <laughs> 